I don't care what you say. These spiders. Ow! <gasps> what happened? Bit me. Oh no. Spiders. Ask anyone at random and there's a 75% chance they're at least a little afraid of them. Spiders have made their way into pop culture as horror icons, superhero catalysts, and of course, the venomous boogeymen waiting in your cupboard to bite you. But out of nearly 4,000 species here in the US, which one actually has the worst bite? And how do the spiders in your backyard compare? Today, we're ranking the spider bites in the US from the very weakest to the absolute worst. And you might be surprised at how dangerous, or not, some of America's most infamous spiders actually are. Starting off in F tier, we have the Hackled Orb Weavers. In a list of the venomous bites of spiders, there's no better candidate for the least potent, because this entire family of arachnids is completely devoid of venom. These small, unassuming spiders love to hang out in the lower levels of bushes and flowers, sometimes inside hollow trees, where they build their really unique webs. Their name comes from the web shape, but also its texture. Unlike pretty much any other spider on this list, their silk isn't sticky, but actually super stringy and easily tangled. This is key to how they survive in the environment without venom. In the game of survival of the fittest, it's do or do not. There is no try. They use this web to not only snag their prey in midair, but to strangle it to death. The spider then bites its prey, using its fangs not to inject venom, but to rip open a hole in its meal's exoskeleton before it literally vomits up digestive enzymes. Because these enzymes aren't being used to paralyze or immobilize or even kill their prey, they're not considered to be a venom. Even if they could bite humans, due to their incredibly small size, it's unlikely they'd be able to do any damage without venom. So the hackled orb weavers find themselves alone in F tier. But rest assured, the next spiders on this list are armed with varying levels of delightfully toxic venom. At the bottom of D tier, we have one of the most recognizable and possibly most infamous spiders on the planet, the cellar spider, sometimes nicknamed the daddy long legs depending on where you're from. These spiders are found worldwide and are members of the family Fulcidae. Characterized by their ghostly pale appearance and long spindly legs, these former cave dwellers found themselves living alongside humans almost exclusively in some areas in a process we nerds in the science profession call synanthropy. The problem with having as creepy an appearance as these guys do and living around people all the time is people's imaginations tend to run wild. We're not sure 100% where the myth came from, but in many circles, it's said that the daddy long legs has the most potent venom of any spider on the planet, but fangs too small to deploy it against humans. That's not entirely true. Cellar spiders can absolutely bite people, though you really won't experience any effects at all. At most, you'll feel a faint, buzzing itch, with minor itching for a few minutes afterwards. Their venom is really only toxic against other arthropods, and they don't have a lot of it either. Add in their tendency to stick to forgotten corners of your basement over seeking out conflict, and you have a bite that is very much not something to worry about at all. Most small spiders that mill about your yard find themselves in D tier. Venomous, but too small to really have much of an effect on people. And they have no real interest in using it either. They'd rather be left to their business, living out their hidden lives in the secret world that surrounds us every day. My goal is to get you up close and personal with this secret world in every video, so that we can find some of the wildest answers about the little things we share our planet with. And speaking of creepy creatures, this is probably a spider you're familiar with. Called house spiders or cobweb spiders, you've probably come across a spider from the family Therididae once or twice while cleaning. They pretty much all have this basic body plan. Super large abdomen with a tiny head and spindly little legs. I've found they have a particular knack for taking up refuge in windowsills or behind your toilet. The vast majority of these spiders are completely harmless, content to eat flies in forgotten corners not taken up by cellar spiders. However, there are a few exceptions from this family that will be making appearances in higher tiers. For most cobweb spiders, the worst you can expect is a faint little sting if they even bother to bite you. Starting off C tier, we have one of the most iconic spiders of all time, known for their elegant, geometric webs, the orb weavers have found their way into the visual symbolism for the entire arachnid order. While they range in sizes, colors, and even times of the day that they're active, I guarantee you there are orb weavers living near you, silently filtering out mosquitoes and garden pests from the airspace of your backyard. But you're probably asking, Spencer, how bad's the bite? Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, there we go. Ah! 
Ooh, 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 yeah, that was a bite. The bite of the orb weavers lands in C tier because it's definitely noticeable. A faint sting with localized itching afterwards. In my experience, I noticed slight muscle weakness downstream from the bite for a couple hours afterwards, but it quickly subsided with no ill effects. These garden variety spiders haven't evolved venom to really harm prey that much larger than they are, and usually rely on their striking colors or late night activity to avoid confrontation with predators. They're not the only garden variety spider on this list though, and the next one can take down larger prey. Probably the most famous group of spiders, and also the least hated by most, are the jumping spiders. While they are incredibly reluctant to bite, anything with a mouth can technically bite if it feels like it needs to. And jumping spider bites aren't necessarily fun either. These guys can take down prey that can be almost twice their size or larger, so they do need to have a decently strong venom. Now, it's not enough to kill or do any serious harm to people, but if a jumping spider were to bite you, you would definitely feel it. The bite has been compared to a wasp sting, usually followed by a little bit of inflammation. Luckily, these are spiders that can be reasoned with. Not only are they the cutest spiders, but they're also far and away the smartest arthropods on the planet. Using their acute vision and incredible little brains, these spiders hunt in three dimensions, tracking prey in real time and calculating how to intercept it. They know right off the bat that we humans are far too big to eat, so they don't have any plans on wasting their precious venom on us if we don't show them any harm. The next spider is decidedly less cute, depending on who you ask. The huntsman spiders, while normally associated with the tropics of the world, do find their way into the very southern regions of the US. If you see a large, flat spider with long legs and incredible speed climbing around your walls or trees, odds are you've got a huntsman. All right, so we got a big spider right there. When we get it down, we'll figure out what it is. They're, they're snake hook. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a huntsman. Yep, it is. Generally speaking, they like structure, places they can climb and hunt for larger insect prey, but also places that allow them to have shelter during the daytime. They're pretty much nocturnal spiders. And the biggest thing about huntsmen is they're ridiculously fast. In fact, it's pretty hard to get bitten by a huntsman in the first place. Most records of huntsman bites end up being dry bites that don't inject any venom in the first place. So despite their large size, I really can't give them any higher than C2. As we move up in size, we start to move up in venom potency too. Larger, faster spiders can be extremely effective hunters using massive fangs and stronger neurotoxins to dominate their prey. This is especially true with the wolf spider, one of the largest and heaviest of the true spiders in North America, the wolf spider definitely packs a punch. And with those huge fangs, if you're bitten, you're gonna know. There we go. Oh! Oh, yeah, that was sharp. The initial pain is intense because these spiders do quite a bit of mechanical damage on the way in. The truth is though, that actually getting one of these spiders to bite you is super, super difficult. Like you have to be trying to do it on purpose. While they may be big and intimidating, they are much faster to use their speed for a quick escape than actually try to pick a fight with a human. This goes for a lot of their close relatives too. Generally, large fangs, decent neurotoxic venom, but little to no aggression means most people will never actually need to worry about the effects of wolf spiders on people. While wolf spiders can be huge, there is another spider that reigns supreme over all true spiders in the US, the fishing spider. And they get their name because they do just that, they go fishing. Fishing spiders have a decent amount of variety and have just as many preferred habitats, but they are massive. When I first moved to North Carolina, I didn't know nearly as much about spiders as I've learned over the years of making these videos. And when I came across one of these monsters, I swore it had to be fake because I didn't think tarantulas lived in this part of the country. They are definitely not tarantulas though, and you'd be surprised where they can live. Despite their massive size, they usually can find little tucked away spaces to hide during the day, so most people will go their whole lives without ever seeing them. Which means bites are super rare, but the fishing spider bite is kind of interesting. There you go. Oh, ah, yeah, there it is. Ah, ah, 
but itchier. Since many of these spiders are capable of taking down vertebrates, it's no surprise that you feel it when a fishing spider bites you. And unlike the wolf spider, you're gonna have some itching and inflammation for a while afterwards too. Their venom is much better adapted against more complex systems like ours, so while not at all a dangerous bite, I wouldn't say it's fun either. Fishing spiders are also a bit more skittish than the other large spiders on this list. So while I would never label them as aggressive, they're definitely one to admire from a distance. Even if they don't bite, a sudden burst of speed from such a big spider is definitely more than enough to freak most people out. To top off B tier, we're actually going down in size, but up in venom. Remember how I mentioned we'd come back to those house spiders? Well, this is it. The brown widow can be kind of tough to actually identify. Due to its kind of drab model appearance, it doesn't look that different from a lot of the other house spiders that find their way into your house. They do tend to get a little bit bigger than most of the other cobweb spiders. And the easiest tell is the spiky, weird looking egg sacs they tend to lay. But if you're still not totally sure whether you're looking at a brown widow, you can use a state-of-the-art scientific technique that I use without putting myself in harm's way. What I do is I'll just poke it with a stick to get it to turn over. And if you see an hourglass, you got a brown widow. What's crazy about the brown widow is it actually has the most potent venom of any spider here in the US, native or invasive. But because the dosage of the bite is so small, the effects aren't that bad. The brown widow is unfortunately invasive, so it's definitely a spider that you don't want to have around. But at the end of the day, it's really not that dangerous, and I really can't rank it any higher than B tier. This right here is a Texas brown tarantula, a very nice sized male. After we just saw a widow spider, you might be surprised as to why tarantulas have made their way into a higher tier. Venom is not the only factor that determines how serious a spider bite ends up being. Most spiders here in the US are so small that the actual mechanical damage that they do is negligible. But tarantulas, that's not really the case. Just like most other spiders, tarantulas are venomous. However, that venom is really not any more serious than the bee sting. The problem is tarantulas have such huge, huge fangs they can really tear you apart if you are bitten by one. And this goes for pretty much any of the other large megalomorphs here in the US as well. Not because of the potency of their venom, but because of the sheer damage they can do to you with their fangs. That being said, megalomorphs here in the US are not that aggressive. Most of them spend all of their time underground in burrows, leaving only to look for mates. And the tarantulas here are puppy dogs. They're sweethearts. You have to really, really pressure them to make them even consider biting you. And if you're bitten by a tarantula in the US, there really isn't any possible scenario where that isn't your fault because they actually have a myriad of other defenses that they'll use long before they even think about biting if you're stressing one out. And the primary one is actually their hairs. Here in the Western Hemisphere, we have what are called New World Tarantulas. In the spider keeping hobby, they're considered to be a lot more docile than their old world counterparts. The reason for that is they can actually use their hairs as a defense mechanism that allows them to deter predators without ever having to bite. And they do this by actually kicking them off and creating a, a smoke screen of these swirling hairs that can get in the predator's skin, eyes, nose, and mouth and cause all kinds of irritation. Here in the US, the tarantulas aren't that irritating. The only place you really have any issues with the tarantulas here is if it maybe got in your eyes. But some of the tarantulas I work with down in South America definitely caused me to itch quite a bit. And speaking of South America, there is another group of spiders from down there that are extremely infamous worldwide. The wandering spiders, known for having the most toxic venom of any arachnid on the planet, some of the members of Tenidae are known man killers. But we're surely safe from them up here, right? Think again. In the southern half of the US, there are actually a few smaller species of wandering spider that can be found in the shadowy parts of wilderness areas. The vast majority of people will never run into one, but if you see a small, flighty wolf spider looking creature, and it has a little square of four eyes right in the front, you might be looking at a wandering spider. 
Jury is still out on whether or not the species we have here are actually dangerous to people, and there are quite a few people who will tell you that they aren't. That being said, conventional wisdom is to treat any large wandering spider as if it were medically significant, and definitely admire from a distance. In the case of the largest of the wandering spiders we have here in the US, there are reported cases of bites from the Florida wandering spider causing delocalized symptoms, such as fatigue, nausea, and headaches for days after a bite, almost like a mild version of a black widow. So, more work definitely needs to be done to understand what these secretive little spiders are actually capable of. And I'm going to lump them in mid-A tier until we know otherwise. As we climb higher, we're looking at one of the most infamous spiders in not just the US, but the world. The recluse spiders. You're probably asking Spencer, well, what's this doing in A tier? These spiders surely need to be higher, right? You might think that, but the reality of spiders in the US is that in the grand scheme of arachnids, the only ones that really climb into S tier are found more in the tropics and are due to extremely toxic venoms and unpleasant dispositions. Out of nine species of brown recluse here in the US, only the common brown recluse, Loxoselles reclusa, is really considered to be medically significant. And even then, serious bites from this spider are extremely rare. In most cases, you'll have some local irritation, maybe mild scarring and necrosis, but nothing life-threatening. And that's if you even feel the initial bite. These spiders aren't known for having extremely painful bites, but in some cases they can cause some long-lasting issues due to how their venom works. While most spiders do use neurotoxins to paralyze and kill their prey, and then mild cytotoxins to dissolve their meals, the brown recluse actually invests a lot of its evolutionary points into its cytotoxin. The family of spiders these guys come from, Sicaridae, is known for having some of the most virulent cytotoxins in the arthropod world, in some cases able to go systemic and cause organ failure. Among recluse spiders in the US, no confirmed records of this actually exist, and even cases of amputations are in question as potentially being really bad staph infections rather than spider bites. Due to the mass hysteria around these spiders, it feels like pretty much any drab brown spider that winds up in your house is a brown recluse, but the reality is, true recluses will have a violin-shaped patch on their cephalothorax and six small eyes where most spiders have eight. These spiders really do live up to their name in that they prefer to hide away in dark, forgotten spaces, so the best way to avoid being bitten is to check twice before you stick your hands or fingers where you can't see them, especially inside cardboard boxes. The recluse spiders live in the bark of dead trees and logs in the wild, and cardboard is a great substitute in areas where recluses are common. In the top of A tier are the widow spiders. We covered the brown widow earlier, but it's actually the native widows that pack more of a punch. In the US, we have four native widow species, the southern black widow, the western black widow, the northern black widow, and the red widow. They all range in toxicity of venom and actual bite effects, but rest assured, they're all highly neurotoxic. The black widows are by far the most common, and there are over 2,000 black widow bites every single year. Just like all their spiders in the cobweb spider family, they have those massive abdomens and long spindly legs. These are also the largest of the cobweb spiders in the US. So even if you don't see their characteristic hourglass, the jet black body and any bright red markings on a spider with this general body plan is likely to be a widow. One of my favorite myths about them is that the hourglass on their underbelly signals that if you're bitten by the spider, Spider, you have only an hour to live, but that's not true at all. What will happen if you're bitten by a widow spider is not death, but depending on the severity of the bite, you might wish for it. These spiders will mess you up. The neurotoxin they use is excitatory, meaning it basically lights up your central nervous system, causing it to fire overboard and sending you into a world of pain. Muscle spasms, headaches, nausea, and fatigue are the hallmarks of a widow bite, and the severity depends on the species you were bit by and the amount of venom the spider was able to pump in. Anecdotal reports have the northern widow as the worst of the native species in terms of symptoms, but the red widow is even more insidious. While the least toxic of these native widows, there are reports of the symptoms of this bite lasting for the rest of the victim's life. 
Where I tend to lean skeptical of anecdotal evidence, like in the case of recluse spiders, the people reporting permanent damage from red widows are researchers and respected naturalists. In my own experience, a bite from this spider only created mild spasms that lasted about 12 hours. But I got a pinch and release bite, not a full tank. And my symptoms matched the progression of Australian latrodectus bites, weirdly enough, which also have rumors of permanent side effects in some circles. Something weird seems to be going on with the venom of the Red Widow, so I definitely think it deserves some special attention in this bite tier list. But one thing's for certain, none of the Widow bites are a walk in the park. What's crazy is at the end of the day, none of these spiders can actually kill you. I bet for many of you that's actually kind of surprising, because I know I grew up hearing that Black Widows and Brown Recluses were death sentences if you were bitten. That being said, even here in the US, it's always possible that in some remote habitat that there could be a spider even more dangerous than the ones I've listed here. For all we know, lurking out there somewhere in North American wilderness there could be an S-tier spider. And if I had to put money on it, my first guess would be the desert sand spider of the genus Hamalonychus. If you want to learn more about that creepy, insane arachnid, check out this video right here. Hope to see you there, but until next time, don't forget to get outside and find your own adventure.